My name is Graham Pearce. We are sitting in my railway, which is called Parkwood Railway, which is situated in Longwood, Huddersfield. I started with a three and a half inch gauge model engineered built loco, which was a black five, which is my favorite loco, by the way, a mainline loco. And uh, I thought, right, we'll build the track in my back garden. So we started measuring up and we couldn't get the radiuses in to get the three and a half inch gauge in. So a, a good friend of mine said to me, well, why don't you try two and a half inch gauge? You know, you can, you can um, get your radiuses a lot smaller with that. And it's just as impressive. So um, we looked at that, measured up, and we, we found out we could get a gauge three, two and a half inch gauge railway in there. We started with the gate three, which was on steel posts, uh, and then we used the board, which was was quite a new development on board, which is called Tricoya board, which is like a, an MDF, but it's waterproof, weatherproof, frostproof, and it has a guarantee not to move, not to swell, not to rot for about 70 years. So we thought we'd try that, and it worked brilliantly, but it's not cheap. It's not cheap at all. And then I decided, we had some um, dry stone walls down the edge of the garden, which were falling down. So we, we got the garden walls out, uh, and then we started building this, this big oval inside with uh, with dry stone wall, which I'd never done before. But I sent to tech to it like a duck to water, you know, um, and loved it. It's like a big jigsaw puzzle. So then we went from there, but we had to literally wheelbarrow extra stone in from friends' houses that were pulling walls down and, and people that were advertising walls that were pulling down, they wanted to get rid of it. And we had to wheelbarrow every tonne through the, the workshop door. Uh, and there must be 10, 15, maybe more tonnes of, of stone in here. So it was quite a big task. It was a sloping garden, uh, and I wanted to get it more or less level for both railways, gates three and uh, the 16 mil. So we had to uh, um, get it more or less level with the, the stone walls, and I, I like the, the effect of the dry stone Yorkshire's walls, you know. Um, we had to also, which I forgot to tell you, that we also had to dig a load of land drains in. So we had a lot of spoil so all that spoil and soil came into the middle, which made it level even more, you know. So um, it all worked out quite good. I wanted a scenic railway in, in a garden. My, my wife likes gardening, and I like railways, so I wanted to combine the both. And, and then obviously I wanted the social side of it all as well. I'm interested in a variety of uh, prototype uh, locos and models. Um, we go to Isle of Man quite a lot. I've, I've raced over there at Isle of Man with, with classic motorbikes. And um, I got interested in Isle of Man Railway, so I got some Isle of Man stock. Um, and uh, this is where you see it running behind Little Nettie, which I named after my wife. Um, it's a uh, Roundhouse Jack, it's, it's about 30 odd year old now, is that local? And um, decided to, to paint it a matte black and, and make it look more realistic. I'm also interested in First World War uh, trench railways. Um, what you see going round now is Alco, Roundhouse Alco, with Swift 16 um, kit built stock behind it. Uh, also a right scale wagon as well.
I also have an Aquacaf Baldwin and a Hunslet, which I enjoy running with the First World War stock running behind it. The plan for the Gates 3 was fairly straightforward, is it one big oblong oval, you know. Um, uh, the, the 16 mil was a bit more involved because uh, we started off with the outer wall and then I built the inner wall and, and then we came in from there and I wanted a spiral. So then I had to go down with the walls at this end and then go to the spiral and then work the way up and then come up to a level at this end and then start going down again for this spiral again. So it was quite a lot of measuring and laser levels and getting the, the, the gradients right, which I found interesting, you know, and uh, challenging. I started off with dry stone wall with a concrete um, slab on top to hold the, the, um, the, the stone together. Um, and then, um, on the inner wall, we started using concrete block and then we just faced it with dry stone wall with tie rods. And then when it comes through the middle of the garden, we just dug and put concrete blocks down, you know. I, I, I got a friend of mine to come in to help me um, uh, with a design. Uh, and levels and what like uh, and things like that um, and then we came up with another challenge that I wanted it to be dual gauge because I wanted it so some of us members that come here or some group that comes here are 45 mil and some are 32 mil so um, and then we found out there's another group that has track powered locos and not battery powered so then I decided I wanted it track powered, which being a nightmare, but we've got there, it works. And on the track power, we've got digital, which basically you control everything from your digital handset. Um, you know, your horns, your whistles, your whatever you want to control on digital. And then we've got um, analog. Uh, it's a system which I, I made a box inside where we could switch from one to the other without having to plug one in and, and plug another one in. So um, so then we did that. Um, but the, the, the trouble with analog that you have to put magnets in the track to, to, to ring your bells, blow your whistles and things like that. But it works. But it's a lot more simple than digital. Digital's quite expensive, really. I've got an old system which works well. The analog ones, some of them have got a switch where you can turn them off, uh, which is handy. Um, but And then you can run your digital. But if they haven't got that facility, you've got to take them off. Uh, otherwise, I'm saying you've got to, you might not have to, but I always have done. You know, just in case I don't like wiring at best of times, you know, when it starts smoking and things like that, it worries me to death. We really tried to get the gradients um, gradual, so we could l run long heavy trains without having slipping going up the, the, the spiral and things like that, you know. So uh, we, we seem to have achieved that, unless it starts raining. <laughs> I decided to, to start a group up, um, which is now called Huddersfield Shed. So uh, we meet on, or we used to meet on a Monday, but now with this lockdown, we've, we've, we've put it on hold for a bit. But uh, we meet on a Monday, uh, and they've been coming to help. We, we built the indoor railway then, so we could run in winter. So we all mucked in uh, one autumn, and we started building the indoor railway. And then by January, we actually got uh, his first run. 
with the indoor railway. We made a flat, a flat door um, to, to, to link up with the outside railway. So um, it's all there, but it was going to be this year's project to link the outside to the inside. Um, but I couldn't do it on my own, so we needed help from the, the Huddersfield Shed lads, um, which they said they, they would help me. Um, but with this lockdown, it's, it's gone on hold for uh, 12 months. So I mustn't uh, forget uh, the most important person, really, which is Jeanette, which has uh, had to put up with a lot, me building this and having bad tempers sometimes when I get it wrong, you know, and, uh, uh, and destroying a garden, you know. She said the fatal thing to me at, uh, at first. She says, I don't care what you do with the garden, as long as you get rid of all that grass. So I thought, brilliant. I can put loads of concrete down, loads of, loads of uh, track down. And then when I did all that, she says, oh, it looks a bit plain. Can I have some more grass back? So then we put some grass in the middle island, which it does look well, actually. And then we put the stream in the middle of the grass as well, which is going into the little fish pond, you know. Uh, because I wanted to try and mimic uh, Leak and Manifold Railway which had the, the river and the, and the bridges and the waterfalls and, uh, and what have you. So we're getting there and I'm on with building some coaches and some stations, and, but it's all text time. I do like scratch building. I, I, I've, I've built stuff ever since I was a kid, you know, airfix kits, and I just can't get that out of my system. Uh, I just love building stuff and the satisfaction when you've built it. So I've built a lot of my stock. I've built all the dual gauge track. Um, I've built a kit coal fired loco. Uh, but my next one is I'd like to build totally scratch built locos. Uh, but it's all time. The railway seems to have taken a lot of my time up, you know, and still is. But we'll get there. The track powered American. Uh, locos and stock is, is basically um, uh, <coughs> an inherited from uh, a friend who, who left me that which he'd um, literally aged it all up and weathered it and it looked stunning you know um, I'm very reluctant to get rid of that um, because of the sentimental value you know but uh, I do I do get stuff that comes straight out of the box but then I have to paint it and put lines on it and you know, personalise it really. And make it look like the real thing, not a, a toy. My favourite loco, because it, it, it brings back memories because of, of me of my cousin who introduced me to the Welsh Island Railway uh, and I got the chance to drive and fire a, a Garrett, South African Garrett. Uh, and one came up uh, track powered and I bought that and I love it to bits, that's my favourite loco. Although I would like it to be live steam, but um, I haven't seen anything out there yet that, that's up to my standard yet. And that one is on digital, so we've got all the bells and whistles all on different numbers and what have you, so uh, it's very controllable is that. The fish pond, I wanted to try and mimic uh, Leak and Manifold, so with the, the river uh, uh, and, uh, and, and a, a fish pond at the end of there for, to, to, to get the pump in, to pump it back up for the river. Um, but uh, my wife didn't want me to put a fish pond in. So um, I dug this hole and I says, oh, I've no more soil to put in this hole now. Shall we put a little pond in? And, she agreed to it in the end, and now she loves it. We've got fish in there, they've had babies, and, you know, she, she loves them. She really enjoys the pond. It's a hobby that brings pleasure in so many different levels. 
you know, I, I can build locos and wagons. Uh, I can meet up with people and swap ideas there. Uh, so it helps, you know, um, with your social skills as well. Um, and, and, and that's the bit that I really like, you know, meeting up with people and discussing railways and, and ideas, you know. Also, when I go to other people's railways and look at their railways and look at what they've built, the stock, the locos, it, it, it's, it's great to see what they've achieved as well, you know, and interesting. And uh, you can learn from them as well. The motivation for, for, for doing this was uh, I was building vintage and classic cars uh, and it just got too much for me. You know, it was just hard work physically as I got older. It was all right when I was young. So I was looking for something smaller to build and create and get a lot of pleasure from. Uh, and model rail, steam, live steam, um, came into my head and I thought, right, let's go down that path, you know. I don't think there's anything I would change. I think uh, I've achieved what I wanted to achieve. I mean, I did set myself a challenge doing dual gauge, and that is quite high maintenance, you know, with different temperatures and cold, hot. And uh, we've had to solder the, the points together. You can't just buy them off the shelf. And sometimes, especially after winter, there's the solder breaks and we have to go around and maintain all that so that can be a pain sometimes but it's worth it as regards running the trains i i, I don't run them enough as far as i'm concerned I, I seem to get carried away and look at a project waiting on a t on a workbench you know and i'm thinking mm, i need to get that done and then we'll get that finished and we'll just take it out and test it and see if it works and then we'll bring it back in and alter it and adjust it here and there and then take it out again and so all I seem to do is t use it as a test track at the moment, you know. But I I'm hoping in a couple of years when I've got everything that I want, I can start enjoying it a lot more. As regards maintenance, um, yeah, we've got we've got quite a big tree here, and we're constantly taking twigs and branches off the off the track and um, uh, the the ballast because I do like the ballast because we've got quite a lot of leaves. And when the ballast isn't there, it's a nightmare to try and vac it or blow it away. It gets all underneath the track, whereas the ballast seems to make it more easier to clean. So I've, I've more or less got it sort of easy maintenance, really. The, the, the ballast is, is uh, I go to a builder's yard and they call it uh, grano to dust, and it's three mil to, to, to two mil or one mil or whatever but it's it's i think it's no bigger than three mil uh, chunks um and i tried always i tried mixing it with sand and cement uh which it, one winter it just cracked and disintegrated uh and then a, another chap mentioned why don't you do, use a, an sbr which is like a, a concrete additive it's basically like a, a a wood glue really but a really good waterproof wood glue so um, I started using that, and it seems to work all right. Um, it, it went down last year, but it was fairly new concrete, and I think there were some salts in the concrete that upset it, and it's come away in places, so I need to, uh, to repatch it. But I think once the concrete settled down and all the salts have come out, I think it should be all right. You might have noticed the little uh, plastic boxes near the points. Uh, what we had to do there, because we were track powering, is put little boxes and, uh, and switches in there. Um, so when we change the point, it changes the priority over, so it's not blowing the system, you know. So um, that was a challenge. So the points are manually operated, but when you throw the, the, the lever, it, it, it switches the micro switch over. Unfortunately, it's not always uh, like this uh, in Huddersfield, a nice summer's day and it's warm and not raining. So we do have the advantage of being able to go inside and run trains inside uh, and also uh, build things inside as well, you know. I'm lucky to have quite an extensive uh, workshop there, really, because I used to work from there, you know, I uh, did all my vintage cars in there. So then I decided to, to sort of semi-retire and, 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 and 
downsize. So then we decided to build a railway in there. So it, it's quite a big facility really, I'm quite lucky there. Uh, plans for the future is, is, is one of the main things to try and get this link from the outside to the, to the inside track and also a steaming bay down there for us all to gather down in that corner and also a, a turntable there. So when we do come off this main line here to go into the steaming bays, we can turn the train round and come back the same way again, you know, and facing the same way. If anybody's thinking of going into this hobby, I thoroughly recommend it. Uh, it's a way of escaping from the real world, which sometimes can be challenging. Uh, and and you, you get to meet some great people and, and some great railways and some great projects that they've done uh, and swapping ideas and what have you there. It, it's great. I thoroughly recommend this. It's a tonic, is this, Bobby, especially if you're retired. So that's all we've time for now. Uh, I hope I haven't bored you too much, me rabbiting on about my railway at Parkwood Railway. So, so that's us signing off and hopefully we'll see you at some garden railway in the future. So it's Graham Pierce signing off for now and back to the studio.